any announcements this morning? Okay, yes. Do you know what? Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next week we're doing soup after church. So from 12 to 1, 12 ish to 1 ish, we'll be doing soup. So if you, there's a sign up in the hallway, there's a lot of people signed up already. There's still some containers if you need them to see me after church. And um, I think that's it. Thank you. Okay, soup after church. Good. Um, we're handing it out. What was that, sir? How many people do you need? Do you need, need more for this Sunday? Or? We could probably use a little bit more if you, if you could. Sure. Thank you. Since soup is the theme here, we're having um, Ash Wednesday service in this church with Redeemer. So we're trying. We're going to have a joint meeting and worship. We're meeting for um, a soup supper, soup and bread, and we'll do that in the chapel area, and then we'll come in here for our worship service. And that starts at six thirty on Wednesday. If you remember, it's Ash Wednesday. That's this Wednesday, and that's this Wednesday. So, um, also anyone who's interested in helping um, a little bit beforehand. We're going to have some people together at 6 o'clock to make sure the soup is okay. I mean, we're not going to make the soup at 6 o'clock. It will be made. But um, come if you can. It will we'll be done by, it starts at 6.30. We'll be done by 7.30, having soup and then coming in here for about 25 minutes for service. So um, put that on your calendar. Today we're going to, today is, um, Transformation of Jesus Sunday. It's when Jesus was transformed. There are several lectionary passages. Um, we're not dealing with the one that actually is talking about Jesus' transformation, but we're talking about Paul and his transformation and then his challenge to us to transform. So that's what we're going to notice new ways that um, God is making us new. So that's what we're going to talk about in the sermon. Um, before we begin, I want to take some time and pray for the situation in Ukraine. I know that this is an area that understands um, Ukrainian people because there are different sections of Pittsburgh that have that cultural history. So let's just take a, a moment and begin this time together um, in prayer. Dear God, we come to you this morning with heavy hearts. We know that you are a God of love and grace and mercy and peace, and that any time there's conflict, that you are the voice to us to work on that. We pray for families that are being separated, for the men that are going back to protect their country, for the women and children who are in refugee status or in hiding or in places where they feel they can be safe. We pray for the leadership of Ukraine, for their, um, their safety. We pray for our part in the conversation that we can be of some help to move towards a peaceful conclusion we thank you for the many blessings in our lives, and we pray that as we notice our blessings, we don't take them for granted, that we notice that they are fragile. We pray for the people that are in times of struggle and fear. Give them hope. Let them feel your presence. We, we know that your church is strong in Ukraine. We've heard the voices of Christians that are praying to you and singing to you. Help them feel our prayers and our support. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let us um, come together in worship using our call to worship. Climb with Moses up the mountain of God. God's the glory shines like the sun. Climb with Jesus up the mountain of God. Christ's glory shines like the sun. Climb with 
Moses up the mountain of God. The Spirit of glory, glory shines like the sun. Climb with Moses up the mountain of God. We, we have, have come, come to see and to worship. worship. Let us pray. God of grace and glory, renew us with your presence today. As we gather to worship you, to sing your praise, to honor your name, bless us with your glorious love, your guiding light, your wisdom. Strengthen us each day and hour through the prayer, through the power of your Holy Spirit, the wisdom of your Holy Spirit, and the encouragement. We hold to your holy word. We pray this with hope and joy. Amen. Now is the time that we pass the peace, so look around and see who's here. And um, make a note to be praying for us. one specific, it's your secret prayer person. So pick a person to pray for in this. And Allison, I'll try not to have you as my person so that you can make such a wonderful cake as you did for your mother. That probably is not the prayer that we need to do, but anyway, that was really beautiful. Okay. This morning, our, this morning our first um, song is Pure Praise. The song is called Majesty, and what we're going to do is we're just going to to honor God, to honor Jesus, and the majesty that just exudes from him, from his throne, all over. So would you stand as you are able as we bring God honor and glory and praise.
And together we pray the prayer of corporate confession. God of majesty and might, we imagine the face of Moses shining with the radiance of your glory. We pretend that we should not look away in fear or feel relieved when he shields our eyes from the effects of your power. We imagine being commended for our courage in the face of your splendor, but we know better. We long to be invited like Peter, James, and John to witness Christ's glory, but we secretly suspect that we too would be weighted down with sleep or feel the need to speak when we should be listening. Test our hearts, O God, Call us to climb your mountain, that we might face our fears and prove ourselves worthy of your holy calling. Amen. By God's grace, we are assured of forgiveness. God is a God of grace and mercy, and God offers us forgiveness. Receive this forgiveness from God and be blessed by God's amazing grace. For this is the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Therefore, 
since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. This is the word of the Lord. Dear God, may your words be found in these words. May we take what you have for us this week, apply it to our lives so that we can leave here more ready to serve you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today our lectionary passage is found from the second letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. And remember, sometimes Paul had a little trouble with this church at Corinth. Um, my goodness, a problem church. And this is the second time Paul has written to them, trying to help these people understand what it is to follow Christ. So let's review here some things about Paul. First of all, he was a Jew. He was born somewhere around between 1 and 10 AD, so he was about the same age of, as Jesus. And during the first century, Jews were dispersed. They lived in several different places around the Middle East, just like today. All the Jewish people didn't live in the same area. Um, for a while they did because they were family units and they traveled. This, at this time, there were Jewish people that lived in a number of different places. So Paul, who was known as Saul at the beginning, um, before his conversion to Christianity, was not born in Israel. He was born in Tarsus, so we hear this is Paul from Tarsus. Tarsus is a very large city. It's located in modern-day Turkey. And Tarsus was a prosperous city at the time. It was a city that was ruled by the Roman Empire. And it's reasonable to think that Paul was a city kid, that he was someone who grew up with some level of privilege, Paul was very well educated. He was a student of the famous Rabbi Gamaliel. Um, and to be a student of Gamaliel, you had to be one of the best of the best, the smartest, the most gifted of the young boys who were in school, all wanted to be this rabbi's students. So he had um, the Harvard Teacher of the Year. He was really smart. He tested well on his SATs. He was excellent at learning and excellent at retaining information. Paul was a star pupil and he became a Pharisee. And he was proud of that accomplishment and that is a big deal. He should have been. Um, this added to his Jewish heritage. He followed the law, the Torah, and he was very good at that. He was proud of how good he was. He was talented and a brilliant Jewish boy. Paul was developing as a leader, as a Pharisee. He was focused on success and was someone who stood out as being holy and righteous, and he was proud of those things, as any Jewish Pharisee would be. Paul was also a Roman citizen, which is a big deal. Um, and actually it gave him some legal rights that common Jewish people wouldn't have. So Paul was a gifted Jewish Pharisee, he was a Roman um, citizen, and he was a success. He was a huge success. One day, a new voice, or a new person, began to gain popularity, and his wild and transformative teachings became a threat to the Jewish way of life and the Jewish tradition, and this man's name was Jesus. Jesus came with a new message, a new way of looking at things, and this was threatening to many Jewish leaders. New ideas are threatening, and we can understand that, because if we really listen to, Jewish, to Jesus' teachings today, we are also challenged, and we are also uncomfortable. The Jewish faith was a set of rules, strict rules, set before you 
that you had to follow in order to be loved by God, to be connected to God. You had to perform. You spent your whole life working to earn this connection with God, working to be good enough to be in the presence of God, working to be worthy of knowing God. And that was the way it was for thousands of years. And it still is in a lot of religious groups. It still is something that's taught in um, Christian circles today. If you perform well and if you're good, um, good things will happen to you in your life and God will love you. That is not what Jesus came to tell us. This was the understanding about how God worked, though. And until Jesus came, it changed. Jesus was preaching a different message than this old Jewish law. Jesus said that he was the Son of God and that he came with good news, a gospel. Actually, the word gospel means good news. Jesus was teaching a new way to look at the relationship that you have with God, a new way of defining who God is and how God looks at you. Jesus' message was about people's relationships with God and God's people, which in Jesus' perspective, seems to include all people, not just your own family, not just the Jewish community, but all people, which was one more thing that was um, broke the backs of a lot of the Jewish community at the time. And sometimes it breaks our backs to think that God loves all people. We say it, but it's hard to really believe that. Jesus' message was not was that no matter what you do, no matter how well you keep the law, that is not what saves you. In fact, no one is good enough to earn God's love. God loves you because God has reached out and chosen to love you. It's about God. It's not about us. It's about God and the grace that God has chosen to offer us. Jesus was and is saying that this salvation must be about the response to offer the offer of God's love. Jesus was and is saying that he came to this earth to offer a new way of connecting to God, to offer a new covenant, one that's personal, one that frees people from this logistical following of the Torah or the law. Well, you can imagine how well that went over with a group of people who were really good at keeping the law. To be fair, the Pharisees, at their best, were men who were really trying to do what they thought God wanted them to do. It's just that Jesus came to let them know that this is not what God is requiring. God is requiring a relationship, not just fulfilling a list of laws. The Pharisees didn't like that. They were zealots, and they couldn't tolerate anyone messing with their Jewish religious heritage. Plus, it's just really difficult a difficult thing to understand, especially if you get straight A's and you follow the laws. It seems that people who are down and out, people who are broken, seem to be able to hear this message much better than those who have um, succeeded in almost everything they've done. So Paul was an overachiever. He was a person who was driven. He was a person who had passion for whatever he was involved in. And when he heard that of this Jesus who was challenging the law of the Torah, Paul was out to destroy him and anyone who was following him. So we read in scripture that Paul was someone who was known to be present at the stoning of the first martyr, Stephen. We follow Paul's story to a time when he was actually on his way to kill some Christians. And on that trip, on that way to the city of Damascus, the road to Emmaus that led to that city, a miracle happened to Paul. Paul was struck down by a great light and he became blind. He heard the voice from heaven telling him, stop doing this. Stop killing those who follow Jesus. And as a result of that experience, Paul was transformed. He was a new person. 
As far as his focus and purpose in life was, it was a complete turnaround. On the spot, Paul was converted and his name changed in his life. His name was changed from Saul to Paul and his life was changed forever. His focus was changed forever. Paul's life purpose was to put all of his drive and energy into spreading the word about Jesus to people who were willing to hear. Paul was the reason why these people in Corinth, most of them were outside the Jewish faith, were told of the teachings of Jesus because Paul reached out to them. He traveled to where people were able to hear and he preached the good news of the gospel. Paul traveled the rest of his life. He was preaching and teaching the message of salvation and the grace of God to anyone who would listen and accept this good news. Paul was truly an example of a transformed life, a life that was completely changed. Paul admits to this and even boasts about his success in areas of being able to be strict and keeping the law. And then he says that all of the laws that he followed, all of the success that he had in this area, nothing compares to the value of knowing that Jesus Christ is Lord. He says he'd gladly give up all of this prestige and this power, all of these major degrees that he got. He would give it all up just to serve as a minister and, and a um, teacher of Christ. So in today's passage in the second letter the Apostle to, of the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth, Paul contrasts his ministry with that of an Old Testament story in Moses. We heard that passage read first. He contrasts the Old Covenant of Moses and the New Covenant of Christ. We are having communion this morning and we talk about Christ is the New Covenant. The Old Testament narrative we heard this morning was about Paul, and as Paul Cusick read, um, the second time Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of stone, um, he refers to this passage and his, his face having to be covered because it shone um, because he had seen God. This Exodus passage tells us that when Moses came back where the people could see him, after he had seen God, that he had to, that he was a different person, that he had been transformed because he had been talking with God. In fact, Moses' face was shining so much that he had to put a veil over his face when he was with people, and then he took his veil off and was in the presence of God. This passage is a mystery. We don't understand it. It's difficult to fully understand but Paul is referring to this in the letter to the Corinthian church. Um, most would have been very familiar with this story, so they would have understood that it's an example of a time when someone saw God in a new and different way than the average person. Only Moses was selected to see God in this way, and it was too much for the other Hebrew people to experience. So when Paul began to learn about Jesus, he started understanding that Jesus was the way to understand God. It wasn't about obeying the hundreds and hundreds of laws that the Jewish people had. And that's not to say that following the law is not good. Following the law is a good thing. Moral laws help us with community, they help us with structure. Um, there's still basic rules that help us in our lives, with our countries, with our families, our communities. But Paul's writing here to instruct these <coughs> readers that the way to understand God, the way to see God, is not just through a set of laws, but, uh, or becoming obsessed with the law, but it is about a covenant with God. It is the way to see and understand God, and we do that through Jesus. This was something the religious leaders in the Jewish committee um, community found very difficult, and that makes sense, because they knew the law, they were good at the law, and it challenged that. It seemed to be going against God. In this passage, Paul's concerned that the Corinthians were overstressing the Old Testament law and understressing the new covenant in Christ. 
Paul wasn't saying that the Old Testament covenant was not applicable any longer. He was saying that neither of these covenants happened because people reached out to God, but that they happened because God reached out to them. That none of them earned that relationship. That we follow a God of grace and mercy who reaches to us and offers us a relationship. Paul believes this old covenant was from God and he followed it throughout his life. But his conversion, after hearing and seeing and believing the gospel message, the good news, the new covenant that Christ fulfills, Paul looked back and said, the old law, the legalistic way of responding to God actually can separate you from the love of God. It can make you feel so good about yourself that it turns about you, not about God. It's about God and the grace that God shows us, reaching out to us in love. We don't win our own salvation. We don't earn our own salvation. It is God who saves us. We do not save ourselves. Paul refers to the Old Testament story of Moses and suggests that Jesus transforms us, changes us to be the people that we were created to be. The passage says that we are being transformed. So I thought I'd look up the word transformed. I was thinking of transformers that my kids played with when they were little in the early 80s. And I looked up the definition, and this is the definition that I got. A transformer is an electrical device that transfers electrical energy between two or more circuits through electromagnetic induction. Electromagnetic induction produces an electro force across a conductor, which is exposed to a time of varying magnetic fields. Commonly, transformers are used to increase or decrease the voltage of alternating currents and electrical power applications. That didn't help me at all. <laughs> all I wanted to know was the definition of the little kid's toy. <laughs> Because I remember the first time when I saw Tyler playing with his toy years and years ago, and he had this little car, and I watched him as he messed with it, and it turned into some kind of robotic monster. And I didn't know how that happened. Um, it transformed into this robot person. It was a transformer. Um, transformers looked like regular vehicles at the beginning, and inside them, though, was the potential to change into something or someone who had powers way beyond the little car that you saw at the beginning. Transformers change power and energy into something useful. In this passage, Paul says that the power of Jesus, the message of the cross, and the new covenant of grace has the power to change you into something you never imagined before, that you can be transformed. I looked up some synonyms for transformation, and there are words like change over, transfiguration, conversion, to shift, to transition, adjust, alterations, redoing, change, or to make new. Once again, the message is that Jesus can make us new. Jesus can transform us, give us strength that we never knew that we had, so that we can be complete. Jesus encourages us to shift our thinking. Our outlook on the world can be transformed. To follow Jesus in the way of living, we can learn. We are here to love God and that we are here to love others. We're not just here to care for ourselves or our own. We are transformed to have eyes to see in different ways, to notice our neighbors, to hear the cry of those who are in pain, to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with our God. We're told that Christ was able to transform us from selfishness to people who notice those in need, who have the eyes of Christ. So remember that Christ is making each of us new, that we are taking on the hands and feet, the eyes, the ears, the thinking, and the actions of Christ. Following Christ means that we are transformed we are made new. We are being molded into useful purposes. 
in this world, in this community, in your family, in your individual life, transformed to respond each day with thoughts and goals of Jesus. This is not about a set of rules. It's about the relationship. And it's about the freedom that we have to transform, to serve, and to worship our God. We have hope that we can move from our natural inclination to focus on ourselves and our own needs. And we have hope that we can move into looking for needs, looking at the needs of others, to care for others, to be the voice of the voiceless, to have ears to hear those in need, to learn about and learn with others as we care for them. C.S. Lewis writes that even though we have a tendency to be self-focused, God has given us the ability and the desire to become transformed. We want to be transformed, and with God's help, we can work to respond to God's grace. Jesus' grace and encouragement allow us to be changed. Verse 18 tells us that we are being transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to the next degree of glory. This comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So this week, look for ways to serve God in all that you do. Be transformed. Search out places where God might use you wherever you go this way, week. And remember that each day that God is making you new. So work to allow God to transform you from one degree of glory into the next. Amen. our invitation to the Lord's Supper. Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be thirsty. Whoever believes in me will never be hungry. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Christ our Lord invites all to his table, all who earnestly repent of their sins and who seek to live in peace with one another. Let us pray. Holy God, God of majesty, we glorify you for your great power and love at work in Christ. By the baptiz baptism of his suffering, death, and resurre resurrection, you gave birth to your church. Deliver us from slavery to sin and death, and make us a new people by water and spirit. Amen. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. We give thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ, on the night before he died, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat this bread, do this in remembrance of me.
and for each of us. Eat this in remembrance of Christ. In the same way, he took the cup, he poured from the cup, and he said, This is my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. This is the new covenant. Whenever you drink from this cup, do this in remembrance of me. is the new covenant sealed with Christ's blood shed for you and for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink from this cup, do this in remembrance of Christ. Every time we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again. Let us pray. Gracious God, pour your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and cup, that the bread we break and the cup we bless might be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we might be one with all who share in this feast, united in ministry around the world. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I can't uh, not think that in Ukraine this morning, there are people gathering together, having communion, remembering those same messages of hope that Christ gives us. May they feel our prayers. This is a time now that we offer our joys and concerns. So are there any specific joys or concerns to offer this morning? Jack mentioned this morning that a friend of his, Tammy, is having um, some surgery and they're looking for 
cells yeah, that might cancer. be cancerous. So um, as we can continue to remember, her name is Tammy. Also Donna is having some surgery, maybe next week or in the future that we can remember. Um, remember Donna. There was a, um, a friend of mine, Ron, that went in um, to the hospital. He had um, a lot of um, like heart failure, it wasn't, but he's home already and uh, doing really well. So glad that things worked out a lot better for him than we thought. And his name is Ron. Ron. I can never remember that name. Strength and encouragement for them. 
and we thank you, God, for them, and we hold them in honor. Somehow, Lord, we know that you are our strength and that you are making us new, that your gift to us for a lifetime is that you hold us in your arms, that you give us peace, that you give us encouragement. In the midst of change and struggles, we hold to your message of hope and renewal. Help us to listen to your voice calling our name, reminding us of your love for us and the love that stretches out around the world. We pray for Donna as she faces some medical issues. We pray for Tammy as she also has some medical um, procedures in the future. We thank you for the amazing medical facilities that we have in this area and for those dedicated um, physicians, nurses, um, workers who are the, are the joint um, community that helps others get well. We continue to pray for Wayne Daly and Linda. We continue to pray that he gains strength each day. We pray for Jim Sykes and for Gloria. We thank you for their dedication. We thank you for any signs of encouragement or strength. We ask that you continue to encourage Jim and not allow him to feel discouraged. We thank you for Paul Cusick and his willingness and readiness to care for Peg, for Peg and her um, life. We, we pray that she gets strength and um, that she feels encouraged. We continue prayers for Daniel Stepinski um, as he is recovering and may be facing some challenges. We continue to pray for Bonnie O'Neill as she is regaining some strength at home. We thank you that Nancy Jocko is doing better. We can ask your continued prayers for her. We know that you are with us as we move through struggles. We pray for the names that are in the bulletin as we move through this next week. We pray for their understanding of your love and your presence in their lives. We continue to pray for the members and friends of this congregation who have died over the past year. We ask your blessings on these families and we pray that they feel your strength and home, hope. We especially continue to remember Dennis as he grieves the death of his brother and his sister. We ask that he continue to feel your strength and your love. Be with those who deal with end of life situations. Help them be surrounded by support and strength and power. Give them a peace that passes all understanding. We continue to pray for our shut-ins, for Pat Christie and Esther Sawyer, for our mission co-workers, Shelvis and Nancy Smith Mathers in South Sudan as they work for peace in conflict. We pray for Genoa Stock, um, prayers for justice, environmental justice among the poor in Peru. We know that you hear our silent prayers, private prayers for families struggling, struggling with challenges or with fears. Help us to hold to your strength, your power, and your love. In all of this, we give you thanks for being ever-present. And now we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We will now receive our tithes and our offerings.
Be with those who are in need, for those who offer these gifts, and for those who will receive them. We dedicate these gifts to further the kingdom of God here on earth. May we live our lives in service and honor to you with grateful praise in Jesus' name. Now we listen to the song. Now our charge to go out from here, um, look for ways that God is making you new. Look for ways that you are being transformed into the person that God created you to be. And as you do, know that the Lord Jesus Christ brings you peace and mercy, that the Holy Spirit brings you wisdom, guidance, and protection. And that we're surrounded by the grace and mercy and power of Almighty God, maker of all things. Amen.
Wednesday. Thank you. 